Hello everyone, my name is Andrzej Tkaczyk, I am a software engineer at Codeline. And my name is Jan Zielnicki, and similarly I am a software engineer at Codeline. Today we would like to shed some light on the topic of hardware offloading and how it can be uh, implemented in software-defined networks. So, what will we talk about? Mm, first of all, we will go through a quick reminder uh, of what actually SDNs are, uh, but it will be very short. If you are not uh, familiar with the topic, uh, I recommend you to uh, check our materials uh, on our website regarding this. Uh, then uh, we will uh, examine some theory standing behind uh, offloading, uh, different offloading approaches, uh, both from software and hardware point of view. Finally, uh, we will uh, consider some real life example uh, alongside with uh, our idea, our solution, uh, of how hardware can be implemented, hardware offloading can be implemented uh, in this example. At the end, uh, we will uh, leave time for questions, so uh, you can write your questions uh, in the chat during the presentation uh, or at the end uh, during the Q&A session. So let's start with a quick reminder about software-defined networks. Um, with the growing number of devices and the packet volume that is processed in computer networks, we need a new way to manage the computer networks that we use in data centers, for example. So we move uh, from a single device uh, consisting both of specialized hardware control plane and providing some chosen features, and we split that into three different layers we call them management uh, layer, management plane, where applications such as OpenStack live and can apply some configuration to our network and utilize it in, for example, virtualization. Then we have control plane. This actually realizes uh, the features used by the management API. And beneath that, we have data plane. And that consists both of hardware devices those could be whiteboard switches, and we have as well a uh, software data plane. And that is very important for our topic of hardware offloading because it actually realizes it. So let's talk about that. So what do we, what do we mean by software data plane and what are the challenges here? Uh, we are going to run packet forwarding and processing in software. So it means a generic CPU running on virtualization host. And uh, although this idea is great and can distribute packets to different VMs, it comes at a cost. Uh, really, packet forwarding in, s in software is much slower than in hardware, both in terms of latency and in its uh, packet volume or throughput. And of course, we need to allocate resources uh, from the host operating system to actually run the forwarding data plane. We need both CPU time and memory. And uh, performance reliability can be challenging. Certain packet uh, traffic characteristics or uh, workloads can impact, uh, or high workloads can impact software data plane performance. And we have uh, some techniques or uh, approaches purely in software to mitigate those issues. Instead of relying on interrupts to acquisition packets, we can use hardware polling on network devices. And instead of copying memory or packets between user space and kernel space, we can run all forwarding application in user space. But really, this results in need for dedicating more resources. So if uh, we have such high costs to actually run software data plane, maybe we can use hardware. And the answer is, yes, we can. So now we can focus on the actual topic of this presentation, uh, which is hardware acceleration. Uh, let's start with some theory. Uh, there are basically two different kinds of offloading, partial offloading and full offloading. Mm, in the first one, uh, the tasks, li simple tasks like um, uh, matching some fields in packets headers, 
uh, or replacing some headers um, is delegated to the hardware, but still uh, the packet must uh, enter mm, the software to be mm, processed by some virtual switch uh, and uh, forwarded to the appropriate uh, destination. Uh, in full offloading, uh, we have full responsibility uh, for forwarding the packet uh, delegated to the hardware. So hardware not only uh, matches uh, some fields or replaces headers, but also uh, forwards the packet to the proper port. Uh, usually it is some uh, virtual function of the card. Uh <coughs> and there are advantages and disadvantages uh, of both solutions. Uh, in partial offloading, we have uh, uh, all advantages of software switching uh, because uh, the packet still enters the software is and is processed there. Um, so we have uh, much lower performance. Uh, in full offloading, the performance is much better uh, because uh, hardware uh, fully processes the packet, uh, but we lose uh, flexibility. Uh, for example, it is harder to migrate to virtual machines because they are directly attached to the hardware. Yeah. And with that general introduction of software approaches, let's consider, consider hardware. And really, the best solution to start with is conventional NIC. It's so popular that you have probably already it deployed it in your software-defined network. And most of the conventional NICs available on the market already support some kind of hardware offloading. Those can be uh, features such as v VLAN or VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation, or matching packets via the headers and de delivering to appropriate VMs. And really, this conventional NIC is very cost and power efficient. It is uh, really cheap, and it doesn't use much of the power. And for the use cases that it solves, it's relatively fast. And of course, since it comes as a closed device, you have all the support from the hardware vendor, which is usually a large company. And that is uh, both documentation and support all during all the time of the life cycle of device. But uh, there are some disadvantages here. Uh, the, co the vendor not only uh, chooses the features, but he as well chooses the API to use those features. So with that, maybe there are some uh, devices that could improve. Yes, because what if uh, you are missing some feature, your vendor doesn't provide it? Uh, and here, uh, smart NICs come. So smart NIC is just a normal NIC, casual NIC, with some programmable part uh, added on board. Uh, usually it is some FPGA or some ASIC, uh, and now we can program the, F the FPGA uh, on our own. So we can just implement the missing feature uh, and use it mm, after that. But not only, uh, not only implementing um, features, uh, since uh, FPGA is a fully programmable uh, part, fully a programmable hardware, uh, we can implement even more complex uh, programs, uh, like for example, Elfly, Elfry router. Um, and uh, now we can do all the routing uh, in hardware. Um, but still there is uh, one connection mm, between software and hardware. Um, in, in this uh, Elfry router uh, example, uh, we still need some uh, routing table, some routing entries uh, to be inserted uh, into the card, uh, and uh, so we still need uh, software uh, responsible for that. Uh, and to solve this problem, mm, there is a next evolution of SmartNix. Uh, it is called IPU, DPU. Uh, some people call it um, next-gen SmartNix, and it just uh, it is just a SmartNix with uh, another CPU uh, added on board. Uh, so now. Uh, our hardware has its own uh, CPU, and so we can run uh, even separate uh, operating system on the card, uh, and there, there 
uh, render uh, our um, software uh, applications uh, that are responsible for, uh, for example, inserting rules uh, in our uh, router. Uh, and now we have full, uh, full separation uh, from, from s software uh, and all uh, resources on the host are freed up. Yeah, and with that uh, general overview of hardware offloading both in software and in hardware approaches, let's consider a uh, general use case in software-defined networking and uh, our demo for our in-house solution. So what we are uh, aiming to do here is VSAN tunneling offload in open vSwitch. And uh, let's take a look at the big picture here. On this uh, diagram, there is a rather complicated uh, software-defined networking environment where we have OpenStack as uh, virtualization orchestration. We have Open Daylight as control plane and uh, Open Daylight manages both open vSwitch instances and uh, hardware routers. For the open vSwitch instances, OpenFlow and OVSDV protocols are used, and in case of hardware routers, NetConf uh, protocol is used. And with that infrastructure, we can provide VXLAN tunnels from our VMs to geographically independent data centers, even on the other end edge of the world. But uh, for our demo, we don't need such a complicated environment. Because of SDN approach, all we need is to have open vSwitch instance, and we know that there will come some configuration uh, to create the VXLAN ports, and that will be done be via OVSDV protocol. On the actual packet uh, processing and forwarding, we know that we need to both encapsulate and decapsulate packets from VXLAN and distribute them to appropriate tunnels and VMs. So let's take a look at the architecture. Yeah, uh, it is a high level architecture uh, of our solution, but uh, it shows uh, all uh, important parts. So this picture is uh, similar uh, to the previous one. Uh, it shows uh, the, the problem isolation, uh, but in more detail. Uh, we have a virtual machine uh, that is managed by uh, OVS instance, uh, and it is connected uh, to the uh, rest of its overlay network uh, via VXLAN tunnel. Um, in our setup, we used uh, Netronom Agilio uh, as a NIC, as a smart NIC, uh, actually, uh, programmed uh, with uh, firmware written by us in uh, P4 language. Uh, and we used uh, uh, OVS uh, using the PDK drivers. Uh, what is worth noting that uh, we used uh, just open source OVS. We uh, didn't do any customization in it. Uh, the only uh, customization mm, was needed uh, in the PDK. Uh, and what are the paths that the packet can take? There are two paths. Mm, we call it slow path and fast path. And slow path is represented by a uh, black line, uh, the bla black arrows, um, where and their uh, packet goes from virtual machine uh, via Netronom Agilio to uh, OVS instance, uh, where it is uh, encapsulated uh, in VXLAN tunnel uh, and sent uh, via a physical port uh, to the net. Uh, the returning packet uh, goes through the same way uh, and is decapsulated by uh, OVS. But mm, since it is a smart NIC, it can process the packet fully uh, on its own. So the fast path is the path where uh, the packet is sent from virtual machine then it is processed by Netronom Agilio, is encapsulated there, uh, and sent directly to the physical port. Uh, and the returning packet can also be uh, decapsulated by uh, the NIC and forwarded directly to the virtual machine. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this path is much shorter. Uh, so we hope the packet will go faster. Uh, what was the development uh, process? 
Uh, first, uh, we needed to understand OVS, uh, the tunneling and offload mechanisms. Um, then we implemented uh, the slope of part in P4 firmware uh, and slope of driver in uh, the PDK. Uh, and with uh, this done, uh, we implemented the uh, fast path part in, uh, in P4 firmware and uh, the mechanism uh, to insert uh, flows into the Neutronum Agilio. Uh, we, uh, why, we why do we even need a slope path? Uh, that's because OVS uh, uses reactive flows insertion uh, mechanism. So mm, the, o the OVS needs to see uh, a packet to crea create a, a flow for it. So the first packet always uh, has to enter the OVS uh, where uh, the flow for this packet is created and then it is offloaded uh, to the Neutronum Agilio. Uh, so the following packets uh, can be processed by the Agilio uh, and uh, it takes fast path. So uh, with this uh, theoretic theoretical uh, explanation uh, of what we've done, uh, we can show you uh, the demonstration. Uh, it is pre-recorded demonstration uh, to avoid any, uh, any issues. So uh, firstly, we will see uh, a ping that mm, goes uh, through slope path. Every ping is, uh, goes through the slope path. Um, that's because uh, offloading is turned off. And uh, as you can see, uh, average round trip time uh, is uh, 0 0.434 milliseconds. Um, it's some time. Uh, and now we can proceed to, uh, to fast path. So now uh, offloading is turned on. Uh, and as you can see, uh, packets uh, go faster, the ping is faster. Uh, so now average round trip time uh, is uh, 0 0.131 milliseconds. Uh, so hopefully uh, hardware offloading helps, uh, but it is not uh, really uh, relevant, uh, re relevant test. Uh, so we use T-Rex to, to test it more appropriately. Just let me comment on this uh, functional demo that you have shown. The important thing to point out here is that the other endpoint that we used, that we are actually pinging, that is running on Linux Bridge. And Linux Bridge implements VXAN encapsulation as well. So the ability to communicate between the VMs actually co uh, proves correctness of our implementation of VXAN encapsulation. Yes. And right now, uh, we can take a look, uh, look at some diagrams that we have prepared. As, as my colleague mentioned, we have used T-Rex as, as traffic uh, generator and analyzer. Uh, we actually run L2 forward instead of VXNAN due to uh, hardware limitations and used a kernel uh, with open vSwitch as reference. As you and as you can see here, uh, the latency improved significantly. We got from the range of 100 to 300 milliseconds to the range of below 200 milliseconds. Sorry, that was microseconds, of course. And not only is the latency better, if we take a look at Jitter, you can see here that the packets passing through uh, our hardware offload solution, we don't do not uh, present much of jitter at all. It means that all the packets are processed in equal time uh, be, uh, through the hardware. On the other hand, in kernel reference, uh, there is a significant jitter measured. And uh, it really represents the mentioned issues with interrupts and uh, interrupts, uh, interrupt handling from uh, NIC and uh, interrupts from uh, other software running on the kernel. So let's move the KTK 
key takeaways uh, for our webinar. Uh, so what are the considerations for acceleration and offloading? Hopefully we have shown you today that um, really for hardware offloading, there is a limited impact on control plane software. Really, usually you don't need any input from it at all. That's because we are using SDN approach. On the other hand, in terms of data plane software, there is wide support present as in showcased uh, open vSwitch and uh, other projects support hardware offloading as well. Tungsten Fabric or VPP are some good examples. And hopefully, we have shown you today that there are both, both different uh, software strategies in, and in terms of hardware, there are mature solutions such as conventional mix, or you could create your own hardware solution for niche applications. So let's, not le let's move to the Q&A session. And we have a uh, first question. Can it mine bitcoins? So <laughs> because it's programmable hardware, of course it can mine bitcoins. And actually in some initial stages of bitcoin implementation, uh, programmable uh, FPGAs were used and then re replaced by, by ASICs. But uh, how does it apply to uh, packet processing? The actual cryptographic engine can be integrated nicely into packet processing pipeline and provide us with some fu functionality needed, for example, to implement IPsec. Yes, we have another question. Uh, is the hardware closed or you, a uh, customer, can log into your devices and how uh, to, how to sec you secure uh, these devices? So let me answer that. Um, yes, the hardware is closed, but uh, on top of the hardware, we are running our own firmware created from P4 language. And uh, actually, uh, the second part of the question, can you log, log into the, your devices? Uh, that device that we presented is part of the host operating system. So we can uh, use it from that. And finally, uh, security. In terms of security, the device is, as I mentioned, part of the host operating system. So you manage security on uh, the level of the operating system. Uh, for example, we, uh, the P4 configuration is uh, provided by Thrift service uh, that manages the card. And access to that is uh, managed by the host's firewall with normal, no, normal uh, applications. Uh, yes, but uh, there is uh, one, uh, one other point that we can add. Um, there was a ballot uh, on the slide with IPU uh, that it is secure. Uh, that's because um, the CPU uh, is um, on the hardware. So, um, there are still some possible vulnerabilities uh, to, you know, hack your uh, host and uh, and break into the your the hardware. But in IPU, uh, in fact, uh, software is on the hardware, so there is no uh, connection between uh, the guest VM and, and the hardware that is responsible for. Uh, for this, uh, for example, routing. Uh, so that's why uh, we called it secure. Yes, in that case, uh, with IPU or GPU, we have uh, full separation and that's the mentioned advantage. Okay, so we have uh, another question. Uh, are you planning on running performance measurements? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, let me explain why. Uh <coughs> It was not the goal of this project. So what was the goal of this project? First of all, uh, we wanted to check if uh, creating a hardware offloading solution using OVS uh, is difficult. Um, uh, additionally, we wanted to use uh, P4 uh, 
language and used hard we wanted to use hardware that supports p4 um, to to make uh, this connection uh, the solution with um, obs and p4 uh, so we chose uh, agilio smartnik uh, since it uh, it supports uh, p4 mm, but uh, it has uh, its drawbacks uh, so Agilio is uh, a seven years old uh, device, if I remember correctly. So we knew that uh, we won't achieve a huge performance. Uh, so before starting, we just assumed that we won't measure performance. Yeah, and we have another question. Can we get observability and stats on what has been uploaded? And actually, there are three layers that we use in terms of software. We have open vSwitch instance, which has own observability and stats. And in there, we can check if the actual uploading has been triggered. And then we can uh, verify that from DPDK side. Uh, DPDK has a telemetry module, so that could be uh, monitored uh, outside of the OVS. Or we could uh, directly monitor logs from the v DPDK via OVS instance. So then uh, we can uh, verify, for example, that uh, communication with network cards is actually correct. And finally, uh, we have the service, uh, the Drift service uh, running on top of uh, P4 that provides runtime configura configuration abilities. And that as well provides, so provides us with some observability and there are stats available on, on there as well. Do you have anything to add? Uh, Yes, uh, we can uh, additionally tell that um, uh, stats uh, is a feature of P4 language as well. So we can use uh, counters or registers uh, in P4 uh, and even attach them to directly to the uh, table entries in P4. Uh, so it's just a feature of the language as well. Okay, so there seems to be no more questions. So thank you very much for attending uh, today's webinar. Hopefully we were able to present a very general overview of hardware offloading. Uh, we meant as it as an easy introduction to the topic rather than an in-depth guide. Uh, really, the iceberg of hardware offloading is uh, beyond uh, our capabilities right now. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you again for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our presentation and uh, I can encourage you to, to check uh, our other uh, materials uh, on our website. Yes, and uh, to wrap up, I have a small announcement. After the webinar, you will get a very short survey about our, your impressions. Me and my team will be very grateful if you leave us some feedback that helps us improve on the webinars in the future. So thank you very much in advance. Yes, thank you and hopefully see you uh, on the next webinar. Bye.